How do snails fight? I'm not sure. They slug it out. This is the Epic Dad Podcast, episode number 11. And on this week's episode, we'll be discussing how play can help alleviate anxiety. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Epic Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Jason McCleary, and I'm here to help you create better relationships, better health, and an all-around amazing life. Each week, I feature interviews with experts to deliver inspiration, motivation, tools, and tricks to create the life you love. The Epic Dad Podcast is here to help you become your best self as a parent, spouse, and all-around epic human being. If you want to remove yourself from the drift and start taking intentional steps to become the epic dad you always wanted to be, then this podcast is for you. Hello and welcome back. I am your host, Jason McClary. Thank you so much for listening. And I am immensely grateful that you are here for yet another episode of the Epic Dad podcast. For those that noticed, it has been quite some time since I put out my last episode and wanted to give a, a little bit of an explanation for that, even though, quite honestly, I I don't really have an explanation. <laughs> I have had four or five episodes already recorded um, and just needed to have final edits and a few, you know, intros recorded and outros recorded and those kind of things. And uh, then getting set up for Instagram and getting it posted and all those kind of things. And, And quite honestly, it was just kind of daunting. It felt really heavy to me through the last part of the year of 2019. And I'm not really sure why, but here I am, and I am ready to kick off 2020. Uh, like I said, I've already got several episodes pre-recorded here and have actually edited them, and they will be posted now on Tuesdays. We uh, had been put it, posting them on Thursdays, but I wanted to make the change um, due to, well, it was due to a lot of the uh, social media kind of marketing posting for the podcast itself, and just felt like posting on a Tuesday really helped me uh, both make the time to edit and post and do all the behind the scenes kind of stuff to get ready. And then also be able to market the the podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So so here I am. Uh, we'll be posting here, like I said, on Tuesdays now going forward. And you will continue to see podcasts, episodes, and interviews uh, launched on Tuesdays. And uh, we'll be looking at adding a few possibly new kind of segments that I'm looking at. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we're working with my my oldest daughter to hopefully get an uh, episode out here with between me and her, um, but more on that to come. But this week we have Charlie Hone, but this week we have Charlie Hone, who is a speaker and author who talks a lot about how he used play to help with his anxiety, kind of going along with the series that we finished off with mental health. We'll have Charlie Hone this week. And then next week, uh, Dan Doty from Everyman will be coming on to talk a little bit about his men's groups and expeditions and those kind of things that he supports and, and a little bit about his podcast of Everyman uh, as well. So hopefully with those, we'll be kind of wrapping up the mental health series that we had going on and we'll be talking with several other new guests about parenting and being dads and and all this kind of fun stuff that we're kind of used to by now. And so without further ado, uh, we will go into this episode and today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is giving listeners of the Epic Dad podcast a free audiobook download for a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. As always, I continue to be on the lookout for great Audible books, and I was blessed enough to get a few credits for my my account on Christmas, and so I went a little bit nutty over the last few weeks trying to find new books to, to listen to. And currently, I am listening to Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters by Meg Meeker, MD, and it is fascinating how she talks about how the father figure really has a strong impact on how your daughters will will look at the rest of the world without you know once they've left your house so i highly recommend picking that one up as your audiobook of the trial and you can do that for free at audibletrial.com slash epic dad 
So my guest today lives in Colorado with his wife, baby daughter, and dog. He's an author, filmmaker, marketing strategist, best known for his playful approach to work. His books, Play It Away, Play for a Living, and Recession Proof Graduate have sold more than 10,000 copies. His work on mental health has reached millions of people. For four years, his article, How I Cured My Anxiety, was the number one Google result for the search Anxiety Cure. He has advised hundreds of authors, including Remy Seti, Charles Duhigg, and Gary Vaynerchuk. He has worked with Tim Ferriss as his director of special projects and helped launch Tim's book, The 4-Hour Body. Please welcome to the Epic Dad podcast, Charlie Hohen. Thank you, Jason. Hey, Charlie, thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, it sounds like you have a, a lot of experience in a lot of things. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> when you chase a, a bunch of things over the course of 10 years, it starts to stack up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of the main reasons I wanted to get you on the podcast, uh, like we were kind of talking before we started hitting record here, was your experience with your anxiety and, and kind of how you went through that. So, um, you know, in, in Played Away, you talked about your life coming out of college. And can, can you speak to that a little bit about, you know, what was happening then and, and what was kind of going through your head? Yeah. When I got out of college, I struggled a lot more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. It was 2008. So granted, the recession had hit. Employers weren't really hiring, but I just thought things would come a lot more easily like they, they did in school, but that yeah. just didn't take. So I spent a few months just kind of hitting my head against the wall, applying to jobs, never hearing back, which is not very different from what a lot of people experience now. Yeah. But it was jarring to make that transition. And I remember distinctly this conversation that I had at a bar with a friend of mine who uh, I knew from college. We had very similar uh, work ethic accomplishments under our belt. And they were stoked because they just landed a sales rep position at Verizon Wireless <laughs> selling cell phones. And I was kind of shocked by this because I thought, man, we, we spent 17 years preparing for the real world and to go out and make something of ourselves and not to disparage anybody who goes to work at Verizon or an entry level job. But I was just really surprised that that was the first step on the path for my friend and for so many of my other friends, we were just totally failing to get any traction. So I decided that week that I was going to work for free uh, for basically entrepreneurs and artists and companies that I really admired and respected. And I was not going to wait for them to hire me. I was just going to give them like gifts of hey, here's some work that I did or here's here's a report I put together based on like where I think you guys are going. Like, would this be helpful? Mm -hmm. And I got that idea from Ramit Sethi. He gave me some really good advice and it just totally changed my life. And I, it led to opportunities that as a recent graduate in Colorado, working in his parents' basement with no connections led me to working full-time with Tim Ferriss, working on a movie promotion and traveling around the country, getting asked by pretty high-level people to help them with pretty high-level work. And I've, that's, that resulted in my first book, Recession Proof Graduate, where I taught others like, hey, stop waiting to be hired. You don't need to be waiting around to be chosen. Just start doing the work and add value. Give it away because it's a way better use of your time than to wait to be selected. Yeah. I think that's an interesting little concept as well, because, uh, you know, I have a lot of listeners who are in a you know, your traditional nine to five, um, but maybe looking to do something a little bit more entrepreneurial or, or on the side. And I think that's a good process to kind of get that, that avenue started, uh, things you can do on the side before, you know, you have 
before you have the, before you have to leave that nine to five, right? You can still do these other things to kind of get your feet in the door um, while you're still doing your nine to five. A hundred percent. And the beauty of it is it is an effective strategy no matter where you are in your career. Like if you're wanting to make a transition, Mm -hmm. even if you're wanting to get promoted Mm -hmm. internally, it is a strategy that is always available to you. If you're a freelancer, if you're an entrepreneur, if you are a full-time employee, if you're a retiree, I've heard from the entire gamut of people who are just in transition and using that to be proactive about intentionally doing work that they want to do. Yeah. So you're doing all these, uh, you know, events and, and special things with, uh, you know, Tim and Ramit and, and all these people and, you know, important people, important places kind of thing. Right. Uh, when did it kind of, or when did you notice that it was starting to go a little bit downhill? It started to go sideways after I secretly ordered brain pills, basically. Uh, they're, they were pills designed to keep people with narcolepsy awake mm. to prevent them from spontaneously falling asleep. I took them for four days and slept a total of six hours. And wow. so that kind of messed with me. The yeah. reason I took them because it was because I was uh, helping oversee an event with a hundred plus people. It was like a four day event. It was mm. a big deal. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to screw it up. I wasn't just taking them for recreational use. I was taking them to be amazing at my job. And I didn't tell anybody. And so I started getting some warning signals from my body after that of basically pushing myself to the brink. But when things really started to fall apart were when a series of events, which I now know were traumatic events, happened sort of all at once. Uh, A family member died suddenly, Mm -hmm. a close friend attempted suicide in the same weekend. And uh, this, this last one was not a trauma, but it was kind of a morale deflator. This huge project that we were working on, the deadline got pushed back six months. So I thought, Uh, previously I thought, oh, I can just kind of push my way through this. And then when the deadline got moved, I I just like collapsed. (laughs) All of those things happened within a 48 hour period. Mm. And I just sort of crumbled and became a very fragile shell of a person and had to quit working with Tim because I I just felt like I was a complete mess. And quitting a job, I also learned is a traumatic thing. <laughs> and so I spent the next couple of months sort of spinning out and not really knowing what to do with myself and my anxiety climbed. And anyway, uh, to spare all the details, I found myself in a state of debilitating anxiety where I was afraid to leave my apartment, where I dreaded having interactions with people, where I suddenly became afraid of people for the first time in my life Mm. and felt very joyless, humorless. I felt like I was in fight or flight mode all the time. I was constantly feeling a sense of dread. I started having panic attacks, which I'd never had before, but Mm -hmm. they're the worst sensation. You feel like your brain tells you you're going crazy and that you're dying and your body starts like responding to that. Uh, you get a rapid heart rate and you, you really worry that you're having like a heart attack or something. And so it was, this was back in, I think like 2011, 2012. And so now, nowadays, fortunately these things are more openly talked about. Yeah. The stigma has changed around the conversation for anxiety. People are more open and stuff about this. But back then I literally knew no one talking about this and I felt very ashamed of those feelings because on paper, my life looked perfect, but internally I was, I felt dead inside. Hmm. And I remember telling, finally confiding in my girlfriend at the time, 
how, what I was going through and telling her I felt that way. And I'll never forget, she started crying and I felt jealous because I couldn't do that. I couldn't, even though I, I felt like I was on the verge of crying all the time, it seemed I was physically incapable. And so there was no release. I felt like I was a prisoner in my own body for yeah. years. Yeah. So what, you know, you finally, finally hit this breaking point, right? What, I mean, is that, was that when you decided you just needed to do something different or was there, was that the catalyst or was it more of a gradual turnaround? It was a slow and steady grind of experimentation, trying everything I could think of and that I came across that could potentially help with anxiety. I tried therapy. I did meditation. Regular. I got to a point where I was meditating an hour a day. Wow. I did deep breathing exercises. I did yoga took every supplement that helps with anxiety and stress and depression at Whole Foods. I did naturopaths. I, I visited chiropractors, massage therapists, prayer, volunteering. I went, I, I did different forms of exercises. I cleaned up my diet. I did flotation tanks. I did psychedelic drugs. I did a six week course specifically for men who were struggling with anxiety you name it, I did it. And with some exceptions, right? Uh, but at the end of all that experimentation, nothing worked. And I felt very much in a dark place where I was not quite suicidal, but I was ready for life to be over yeah. because I felt like I was stuck permanently in that condition. Yeah. I can see how that could be super frustrating when you're, you're listening to all these quote unquote experts, right. And none of it seems to be working for you. And that, especially with anxiety, I, I would imagine that just kind of heightens that a little bit more. Like what, what is wrong with me that none of these things are working for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what, what was it that kind of, or that finally brought you around to, um, at least starting to make yourself feel better, you know, what steps did you take? What would you suggest for my listeners who are starting to feel the sufferings from that and, and how they can start to turn it around? Sure. So the questions I heard there were like, what was your aha moment? Yeah. What steps did you take? And what can my listeners do right now if they're feeling the same way? Awesome. So the aha moment I had was I came across a book called play just by chance at a friend's apartment. And it was written by a doctor named Stuart Brown. And this book just basically explores like, why are human beings, why do we play? Uh, it's, it's a good question. You know, it's similar to like, why do we sleep so many hours of every day to rechart? Like, it seems like evolution would have evolved that out. It seems like an extreme compromise in vulnerability if you're trying to survive, you know, yeah. to, to turn yourself off for eight hours. <laughs> it's similar with play where it's like, shouldn't we be focusing on these things that keep us alive? Well, play, human beings are one of the most playful species on the planet. And we play nonstop uh, when we're kids, if, if we are allowed, because play is this adaptive behavior we've evolved with that helps us survive and thrive. It helps us learn empathy. It helps us safely bond with the people around us. It helps us explore our environment. It helps us learn skills. It helps us decompress from stressful, challenging situations and process them. And there's all these benefits. And th there were two quotes in the book that stopped me in my tracks and, and actually made me burst out laughing. One was the opposite of play isn't work. It's depression. Mm. And I forget what the other one was, but it was, it was basically along those lines of like, if you don't play, let me see if I can find it real quick because I know I have it written down. Oh, um, a lack of play should be treated like malnutrition. 
It's a health risk to your body and mind. Yeah. And so these two things, uh, this book gave me this aha moment where I was like, oh, no one's really told me to play, to <laughs> add play back into my life. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, I've completely deprived myself of play over the last several years. I've, I've became a obsessed with productivity and yeah. success and, yeah. and making money and like all these things that are continually reinforced as adults in the working world. Yeah. And I just haven't allowed myself to, to play. I'm an achiever. I like to work a lot and I haven't allowed myself. I wonder what would happen if I start incorporating play. So the next day somebody emailed me and they said, Hey, why don't we go meet up and grab some coffee and I just said, why don't we go play at the park instead? It's, why don't we go play catch at the park instead? It's a lot more stimulating than drinking stimulants <laughs> and acting like we're super impressive to each other. Right. So after that catch meeting, I came back to my work with this sense of levity, this sense of lightness, like a, a weight had dropped off me. I came back feeling joyful which I hadn't felt in a really long time. And so I just started doubling down on adding play. I started playing home run derby. I played catch every day. I signed up for uh, some extracurricular sports groups and those things worked and they helped and they were good, but nothing helped me more than improv comedy classes. And I don't think improv gets recommended to people who are struggling with anxiety and depression enough because it sounds like a terrifying ordeal. Yeah, yeah. But it is really the practice of play, of letting go, of regaining control in the face of challenging things, of not trying to make everything perfect anymore, but taking whatever's happening in the moment and running with it and not worrying about the future outcome, just seeing what you can make. And that was transformative for me because when, when we're adults, we're trying to win games. We're trying, yeah. we're focused on outcomes and results in yeah. future things and sacrificing how we feel in the moment. And just that practice of being around people, of having fun, of not caring about the outcome, of just seeing how hard we could make each other laugh totally transformed my life. And I ended up doing improv for a few years. And now I, I teach other people how to play, especially busy professionals who are just in this state of debilitating stress. And that's why I wrote the book. That's why um, I continue speaking about this message. You know, it's been six, seven years <laughs> and uh, I've, I believe it's this essential part of humanity and in life that we tend to neglect. And I've seen it literally save people's lives. And yeah. so that's, that's why I talk about it still. Yeah, absolutely. So in, uh, in sorry to cut you off, Jason, oh, you asked one more question. What are steps people can take right now to start alleviating their symptoms and get them out of anxiety, stress, which is not a joke. Like people think they can put this off, but it literally has the power to destroy your marriage, destroy right. your relationship with your kids. It can put you in the hospital. It can put you in a grave early. It can do, it can irreparably damage your life if you let it go on too far. Yeah. So it's not a small thing to start adding this back into your life because people think, Oh, play is frivolous. It's childish. It's not productive. It's, you know, I, I don't even know how to play anymore, blah, blah, blah. And I say, stop, <laughs> stop <laughs> focusing on, on how uncomfortable you'll feel or justifying why you shouldn't do it and think about what the costs are to staying in this condition for yourself. Yeah. The first step I always tell everybody is examine your play history. Take a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and write down, what did you used to play when you were a kid, when you were free, when you weren't being judged, when you weren't being graded, when you weren't being paid? Write down those activities, re-examine them. What were they for you, Jason? What comes to mind? 
Uh, for me, it's just a, a matter of, well, this is part of it, right? Uh, and, and this kind of goes back to why I started the, the, the podcast. Um, you know, I found it very anxiety ridden to, you know, I, I basically commuted uh, almost an hour each way every day, still do, but that was pretty much it, right? I would go to work, the, the job that wasn't really fulfilling, but stressful and had to get stuff done, come back, sit in traffic for another hour and then come back and deal everything, deal, deal with everything that had to go on at home and not get a lot of outside social aspects. Right. And there wasn't, there was basically no play. I wouldn't have time to play with the kids in most days. Um, and so, you know, just hanging out with friends and, and listening to people uh, with great ideas and, and that kind of thing that really energizes me a lot. Um, and then obviously there's, when I do get to play with my kids, I, I enjoy doing that and basically doing anything game, you know, board games, video games, uh, just running outside and, you know, going backpacking and stuff like that. It's, it's great for me. That's great. Yeah. And I would encourage as a next step for listeners after they've looked at their own history is just do one of those things for a half hour today or tomorrow. Yeah. Like just, just do it. I, I spoke with a doctor who said something I'll never forget. She said eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, eight hours of play, no negotiating. <laughs> that is the golden ratio. Yeah. And so you, you might think eight hours of play, that sounds outrageous, impossible, but it's more of a challenge for you to actually look at your schedule. Where the hell is your time going right now? Why are you so stressed? Are you sleeping five hours a night and working 19? That's unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Like you will break and you will get sick and die earlier. <laughs> like it's not even, it's not even a, um, like, of course, like disclaimer, I'm not a health person, but <laughs> you, that you are following a formula for illness. And yes, it can affect your mental health. Absolutely. No question. And when you are bombarded with constant stress that never relents, like our brains, you know, we evolved in a climate where we were only feeling extreme stress when we got chased by a predator right. yeah. or, or like attacked by another human being. But now you can have constant stress all the time in the workplace if you allow it. And so the fight or flight is constantly being on, on, on. And what that does to your brain is it starts to shut off your rational parts. You, you'll, you will notice your memory will not be as good because it starts shutting that off too. So this is like to add a little bit of play tricks your body into thinking we are safe. We are not in fight or flight anymore. We are safe. We are doing things that are fun, that are making us happy. We can start to calm down. Yeah. We can start to enjoy. We can start to connect again with our kids, our partner, our friends. And that's what life is about. It's not about being successful. It's about connection. When you were going through this experience, this was before you had kids, correct? Yes. Yes. How do you think, if at all, do you think you would have changed any of the way that you went through this healing process had you had your daughter when, when this, you were, you were diagnosed or, uh, you know, when you started having all these issues? I think I would have been more open to the, like the medical establishment mm -hmm. recommendations. Mm -hmm. I was resistant to taking pharmaceutical drugs mm -hmm. for numerous reasons. I did a lot of research. I tried them. I found them to be really unpleasant and just, they weren't for me. I'm not advocating against them for anybody. It's, sure. it's a totally personal choice, but I would have been more open to that because it wouldn't have been just me, you know, yeah. like, 
Hey, this is going to affect my marriage, my relationship with my kid. Like I can't be selfish and go about like figuring this out in alternative ways. I just need to like suck it up and, and go that path. That being said, I still believe in the power of play to transform sure. people out of stress. And it's especially good for people who have kids. Your kids want to play with you. Like yeah. you have an excuse <laughs> to play as often as you want. You, you, you actually don't have an excuse for not playing if you are a parent, you know? Yeah. So I, I would have followed the same trajectory, but I would have been much more open to doing things that maybe previously I would have been uncomfortable with doing over the long run. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I totally get it. I mean, there's plenty of, um, you know, I've, I've suffered from depression in the past and, and again, there's, there's plenty of natural ways to get through it. Right. Depending on the severity, obviously. Um, but for me, it was more of a, I need to cover this, you know, so that I don't blow up on the kids or, or do something, you know, that I'll regret. And so let's deal with this the way um, modern medicine, I guess, has it for now while we work on other means to, um, you know, get through. So, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely agree. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think you will be or are, um, a little more hyper aware and maybe start seeing signs if your, your daughter starts to show any, um, any signs or behaviors that might lead to some sort of anxiety in the future? Oh my gosh. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's a great question. I'm actually really, really glad this happened to me because yeah. kids, and teenagers especially are super susceptible to anxiety, especially girls. Yeah. Because, it, I mean, they're growing up in a world of social media. Like that fundamentally just really messes with them in in ways that are devastating. I mean, you, you can see there is a direct strong correlation between teen suicides and when the iPhone yeah. came out and yeah. started gaining traction with social media. Like they, they live in this world now that plays out in front of them. And in the absence of a story, we create stories yeah. and we create meaning. So if they see something that happens on social media that they don't entirely know the full story, like somebody has a party and they weren't invited it's not that that person intentionally excluded them. Maybe that's not the case, but they will create that story in their head. Yeah. I think you know? they're constantly being berated with, um, you know, the best of everybody's life. Right. You, you see the highlights. Right. And a lot of our, our kids and especially teenagers are along the lines of, well, I don't have that. What's wrong with me? What, why, what am I not doing in order to be that person? Right. So I think a lot of that is, is happening to our kids and, and causing some, so irreparable damage that, uh, you know, is going to, we'll see what happens in the future. But, uh, you know, as a parent, I am trying to step in on my side and, and negate that a little bit. Uh, so yeah, totally. And, the, and there's, like, keep in mind the people who created these things, uh, this technology, these social media platforms, like they're like drug dealers. They're not doing their own product. They put restrictions on their kids because they know how damaging it can be to somebody who doesn't have a fully formed brain. Yeah. You know, so it's like you can't be laissez faire with this technology, you can't just like, let's see what happens. It is a huge experiment and the numbers are in, it is devastating to teenagers. So you have to be aware of this stuff. You yeah. can't just let it, let it run its course. Yeah, for sure. What lessons or values are you bringing into your family in order to, to maintain that, that high value in, in play? Well, both my partner, my wife and I are playful people. So we, we value play and we, 
I mean, there's, there's a book I think called the four habits of a joyful marriage or of joyful marriages. And the number one habit is play. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I tell this story, I, I'll never forget this one fight we were in about money and we were just, we were in a heated fight and we couldn't really, <laughs> we, we just weren't hitting any like breakthroughs. Mm-hmm. It just kept <laughs> festering and getting worse. Been there. Yep. And I remember in this fight, I was so thankful that I had taken improv because I just <laughs> kind of stopped and realized like what was happening. And I just said, okay, stop, switch roles. <laughs> you be me and I'll be you. And it's just like, it broke us out of the fight because of course she, <laughs> you know, played me like, Oh, I'm so depressed. I'm so angry. I never get anything I want. And I, I, you know, ragged on her and everything. And it was just fun. And, and we snapped out of it. We got out of the fight, we reconnected and that could have totally played out any number of other ways that aren't healthy or conducive to connecting. And so Play has helped us in that regard in that we can de-escalate from fights, I feel like, better and reconnect faster. And it's always a practice. Like, we're not perfect. Like, we still fight and everything. Um, but play is a value in our family. Um, we we really both are much more emotionally open and supportive with each other. Like, play requires trust yeah. and in to catch somebody in a vulnerable moment and to not take them too seriously or punish them for you know just being like that's and that's the way kids play you don't see little kids before the age of like four or six punishing each other for learning right. and curious and trying and opening up and yeah. expressing themselves you know so I, I just find it's a really healthy mindset. And there's this quote in the Bible that I'm, I'm not religious, particularly I, I'm spiritual and I study spiritual texts, but uh, this quote sticks with me. It's Matthew 18, three. And it says, if you don't become as children, if you don't change your hearts and become as children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think, that is something that I think about uh, quite a lot is to strive to have the heart of a child is, is a worthwhile pursuit yeah. in a challenging one in a world that where your heart can be hardened. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, thank you, Charlie. I know we're, we're kind of running up on time here and I want to be, cognizant of your time. So I I definitely appreciate uh, everything that you had to share with us today. Do you have any place where we can send our listeners to learn a little bit more about you and what you do? Yes, sir. It's charliehone.com. Just type in something that sounds like that in Google. (laughs) It'll be the first thing that comes up and you can always get my book played away on Amazon and any of my other books. Fantastic. And I know you have a couple of TED talks out there too, um, which are, are great. And I'll encourage my listeners to put the links in the show notes as well. But thank you very much, Charlie. I hope you have a fantastic day, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. Absolutely. Once again, today's podcast was brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash epic dad. With over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, I know you'll find something amazing. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode. All the links for Charlie will be available on the show notes for this episode at epicdadpodcast.com slash 011. You'll also find links to our Facebook community if you're looking for a place to connect with other dads who are working towards making their lives epic. Head over there or to epicdadpodcast.com slash community and you will be sent straight to the group page where you can request access. 
on next week's episode as we mentioned in the intro we'll be talking with dan Doty, who is the host of every man podcast as well as the co-founder of everyman.com and we'll talk about his experience and how men can find better community in this day and age remember if you want to support what i'm doing here then head over to epicdadpodcast.com slash review to subscribe and leave a review over on iTunes. You can also do the same on Stitcher, Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast feed from. Until next time, have an epic day.